Hey guys, welcome to Relatable. Happy Tuesday. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Good Ranchers. American meat delivered right to your front door. Go to goodranchers.com slash alley. That's goodranchers.com slash alley. Okay, we've got a wonderful, encouraging, enlightening conversation for you today with Mr. Robert Woodson Sr. He is the founder of the Woodson Center, which was established in 1981, which focuses on helping grassroots, faith-based, and community organizations confront community problems and create sustainable solutions to community issues. Um, He has been a civil rights activist and advocating on behalf specifically of the black community and really countering a lot of the failed solutions that we have seen from the left and the false narratives that we have seen from the left over the past few decades that have actually ended up just decimating the black community, hurting the very the very people that these activists on the left say that they are aiming to help. So he has done amazing work. He is motivated by his Christian faith, which you will hear infuses all of the work that he does. In 2020, his center launched the 1776 United Campaign as a counter to the false 1619 Project. So we're going to talk about all of that today, the problems facing these communities, what we, not just as Americans, but specifically specifically as women, as mothers can do to combat a lot of the division and the very real problems that are facing our children, really children of all different backgrounds and how we can kind of just remove this um, this blinder that has been put in front of us of divisive racial rhetoric and false ideas about race and the history of race in America to see things as they are so we can enact effective solutions together. You're going to love this conversation. You're going to learn a lot and you're going to love him for sure. And so without further ado, here is our new friend, Mr. Robert Woodson Sr. Mr. Woodson, thank you so much for joining us. I know a lot of people are already familiar with you. They've been familiar with your work for a long time. Maybe they read your recent book or they see you on Fox News. But for those who may not know, can you tell us who you are and what you do? Yes, I'm the uh, founder and president of the Woodson Center. Uh, For the last 40 years, uh, the organ is a national not-for-profit headquartered in Washington. And we provide service to grassroots, low-income leaders in uh, maybe 39 states, about 2,500. And we assist them in developing self-help programs to address poverty, crime, and violence from the inside out and the bottom up. Prior to that, I was active in the civil rights movement um, and uh, worked for the American Enterprise Institute for five years. But for the most part, uh, my passion is helping low-income people to develop strategies to uplift themselves from poverty. Tell me a little bit about the difference um, in the programs that you guys support, the policies that you advocate for, the kind of self-help strategies that you guys are employing versus the solutions that we often hear from the left to alleviate poverty and that we've really seen fail over at least the past 15 years. How have you guys kind of set yourselves against those supposed solutions on the other side of the aisle? Well, one of the reasons that I got involved in these issues in the first place, when I was leading civil rights demonstrations in the late 60s, um, I found that many of the people who sacrificed most low-income people who were on the picket lines did not benefit from the change. Mm. When we were picketing outside of a pharmaceutical company in Westchester, Pennsylvania, when they desegregated their workforce, they hired nine black PhD chemists. And that became a metaphor for what was to happen over the next 50 years. The the poverty, uh, the approach the government took in the 60s was to spend $22 $22 trillion over the last 50 years on programs of aid to poor, 70 cents of every one of those dollars did not go to the poor, wow. but those who serve the poor. And these professional providers ask which problems are 
fundable, not which ones are solvable. So we really created a commodity out of poor people with the consequence that there were perverse incentives for really reducing poverty. That's why in the face of these expenditures, poverty has has barely moved in the last 50 years right. because we have perverse incentives for people to be self-sufficient. Right. And tell me in your estimation what these programs have done to the family in general, but specifically the black family? Because of course, the left kind of separates these issues. They don't want to say that those perverse incentives that you just described actually do disincentivize um, present fathers. But that seems to be the case. That seems to be at least a correlated trend over the past 50 years since the start of the welfare state that really across all races, but especially among black Americans, um, it is more and more likely for a child to be born to a fatherless home. So can you talk about that connection? Sure. One of the big myths that have been uh, uh, perpetuated by the left, particularly in their 16, 19, that the 70% 70% out of wedlock birth in the black community is somehow a legacy of slavery and discrimination. Right. Uh, but that is just not true. Someone said, unless we can deal with fact-based truth, then lies become normal. Mm. So what we did at, at, at the Woodson Center is we looked at the record and we found that immediately after slavery, uh, they looked at the records of six plantations as to the state of the family. 75% of those slave families had a man and a woman raising children. Mm. And the two-parent nuclear family continued for a century up until 1965. 85% of all black families had a man and a woman raising children. In fact, in the 1930s, when we when racism was enshrined in law and the country was going through a depression, the black community's marriage rate was higher than any other group in society. Elderly people could walk safely in their communities without fear of being assaulted by their grandchildren. And But all of that changed with the government intervention in the 60s, where some uh, so, uh, leftist scholars, Clown and Piven, said if you separate work from income and make welfare more attractive, and then it will result in the disintegration of the family and therefore, poor people will be compelled to turn to government. And that's where they thought they could move the country to social. And they were right. The poverty programs made welfare more attractive. Uh, they stigmatized two-parent households as being Eurocentric and therefore racist. The Black Power Movement joined in that consensus. The Women's Movement joined. So you've got a combination of public policy. You've got social uh, forces. And then you've got government action, opening welfare offices, making welfare more attractive. And as a consequence, the, the, the black family disintegrated within a decade, something that slavery and, and Jim Crow couldn't accomplish, but liberal government programs decimated the family. And that's why we have the mess that we're in today. Um, and so that's what we're trying to combat. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right that they use that argument, and we're going to talk about your 1776 project, but this whole 1619 critical race theory idea is really that America hasn't changed since 1619, but that oppression and slavery has just taken on new forms. So, you know, they connect it to Jim Crow, and then they say the reason for fatherlessness is not just generally the legacy of slavery, but also mass incarceration. Again, they have to blame, you know, white supremacy and the right wing system or whatever it is. But as you pointed out, the fatherlessness rate actually among white and black Americans started to skyrocket in the 1960s before the so-called war on drugs and mass incarceration, which really kind of the tough on crime policy started in um, the 1980s. So it actually more strongly correlates to what you're saying, the growth of the welfare state, not the tough on crime policies of the 70s and 80s, not Jim Crow and segregation, it really does correlate with the timeline of the welfare state. But the left can't own up to the fact that their proposed solutions have actually failed the very people that they said that they wanted to help. They really are injuring with the helping hand. But, they, right. but again, we, need, we must introduce some facts. First of all, I lived in New York in the late 70s and, uh, and the demand for tougher on crime came from the black community. Mm. 
the Rockefeller laws that were put in place came as a result from the black community because we had three major drug gangs operating in Harlem. And it was a crisis, and that's where the demand for longer, stiffer penalties came in response to the black community's demand for it. Um, and so it wasn't because of any racist policies. It came from the black community. Yes. There was an interesting Pew Research poll. Well, actually, let me let me say this first. I remember when there were so many conversations in 2020 about defunding the police, and this mostly came from, you know, academics, both black and white academics saying, you know, this is the way to liberation and equality and release from oppression for black people. But if you looked at the polling, Gallup conducted a poll that showed that about 80 percent of black Americans either wanted the same level of policing or more policing in their communities. And then there was a, a recent just the other day, there was a poll that came out by Pew Research asking um, black Americans, like, what is most important to you? What do you feel like right. um, affects your life the most? Only 3% said racism. One of the first things was violence in their communities. Right. And yet, if you listen to the mainstream media, if you listen to Black Lives Matter and the activists and academics that claim to be representing the black community, you would think that actually the biggest problem and detriment um, to black Americans is white privilege. That's just <laughs> not the case. It really isn't. And again, my colleague Delano Squires, yes. I think, stated the issue uh, very adroitly. <clears throat> he said that this narrative is in, driven by guilty whites who are mm. seeking absolution from crimes they never committed and self-entitled elite blacks who are seeking uh, uh, absolution from injustice they never suffered. So this narrative is being driven by elites who are grievance merchants and they profit from America's grievance. But that study from Pew was echoed over the last 20 years. The Joint Center for Political and Economic Study, a liberal democratic think tank, did similar studies every four years. And those they, that kind of outcome was consistent. Race always scored at the very bottom. It has never been a primary concern of Black America today. This is being manufactured by elite class of, 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 of poverty and, and race merchants mm. who profit from the suffering of low-income Blacks, and they cover their actions with this false cover of racial justice that they're seeking. Taking a quick break to tell you guys about our first sponsor for the day. You know them. You love them. Maybe you eat them every single night. It is good ranchers. Okay, if you've been thinking about getting good ranchers and you've been trying to decide but you don't know, now is the time to bite the bullet. I don't know if you guys have seen, which we'll talk about soon, but these crazy stories of these food processing plants being burned down or destroyed in some way. We've got some scary things coming. Like I I mean, it's I don't want to get too freaked out here. But I think it's safe to say that we don't know what is ahead of us as far as food shortages go. So it's better to be safe than sorry. You should just go ahead and get you a box of Good Ranchers or shipments of Good Ranchers to come every month to your house. And then you can have all of this frozen meat and you can save a bunch of it if you don't eat it right away. Um, even if you're just a single person or if you have a large family, either way, it's good to have a lot of frozen meat on hand. It absolutely couldn't hurt. And then there's also the benefit to... Uh, there's also the benefits of supporting American farms and ranches, which is what you are doing when you are ordering your beef and chicken and your fish from Good Ranchers. It, all's, it all comes from American farms. Plus, it's really affordable. If you use my code Allie, you get $30 off your first box. Go to GoodRanchers.com slash Allie. Use promo code Allie for that $30 off. That's GoodRanchers.com slash Allie. GoodRanchers.com slash Allie. The activists and authors, they make a lot of money from saying this stuff. And then the Democrat politicians who have been in charge of these districts, these communities for decades, of course, they benefit from more dependent constituents because they can just get reelected and re-solidify their power. So there are a lot of selfish motivations in this kind of manipulation that we see, unfortunately. 
I'm wondering if you can give insight into why these liberal policies have so seemingly disproportionately affected negatively the black community. I think they've negatively affected Americans of all backgrounds, especially impoverished Americans. But why do you think we see the disparities that we do to the level that we do when it comes to fatherlessness, when it comes to crime, when it comes to homicide, even things like maternal mortality um, of women, the actually leading cause of maternal mortality for black women is not anything that happens in a hospital, but is actually homicide by a domestic partner. And it's, I think any person, any thinking, feeling person doesn't want to see these disparities. So why is it that black Americans seem to be so disproportionately affected by all of this? The left says it's systemic racism, but what would you say? I mean, I guess you've already said the programs, but what else? Yeah, I think it has it, it, the very fact that we all know who George Floyd is, but mm. we don't know who Ariana Delan D- is. She is a three-year-old who was sleeping next to her grandmother on New Year's Eve and a bullet ripped through and tore through her body. And she's in intensive care as we speak. Wow. She was the niece of George Floyd. Wow. I didn't know that. But, but no one, and, there, and, and every five minutes, a child is shot in the country. 50 children have been murdered over the past year. But we don't know this because you have an elite group of, of blacks and guilty whites who are driving this face, fake race narrative because it is profitable for them. You cannot generalize about any group of people are all women or all blacks, and therefore try to apply a remedy because it always helps those at the economic or better educated group. Mm -hmm. We don't have a race problem in America, but we have a grace problem. But those who are advocating against the police uh, are themselves hypocrites because they do not live in communities that are at risk. They have armed guards. The uh, members of Congress spend three hundred thousand dollars on personal security mm-hmm. while advocating defunding the police. But also, it's lethal to tell a to to convey to a group of people that your destiny is determined by somebody else. I think it was jo- Pastor jo- Chuck Swindell said, 10 percent of who we are is defined by our external circumstance. Ninety percent is our attitude about the ten percent." And this is where grassroots leaders that we support understand that their destiny is in their own hands, not in those who are who will get paid to voice their grievance. Yes. Before we before we get into all that you're doing even more in the 1776 project, I just kind of want to take a pause because you mentioned that we don't have a race problem and we do have a a grace problem, which I couldn't agree with more. I want to hear a little bit more just uh, about your story and particularly your faith story and how faith has played a role in the work that you have done over the past 40 years. Well, part of my, uh, my discovery, when I started the center, 40 years ago, after 10 years, I wanted to deepen my understanding of why grassroots leaders are more effective in changing people's attitudes, values, and beliefs. So I had a, a t- town meetings in seven different locations where I brought grassroots leaders in from around about 100 miles. And I asked them what works and why does it work? 95% of them brought the people whose lives had been transformed to the meeting so that they could speak for themselves. 95% of them said, faith in Christ works for my mm-hmm. life. Mm-hmm. And so people told me, Bob, you're gonna, this is going to change you and it's going to change your organization. And it did. I had staff members leave. I had funders leave and say, are you becoming a church? I said, no, I'm not. I'm just reflecting on what the people told me. So I, 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 we, we took a profile of what these principles was, and we had a conference where I brought 150 of them together because I did a report on, on the outcome. And I asked them, did I get it? And sure enough, from that day on, I knew that the reason that these people were effective when they had no funding is because they served as witnesses to people 
that transformation and redemption in the midst of a toxic drug infested neighborhood is possible. And so what I did was begin to chronicle that success. If you say that 70% of black families have uh, raising children that are troubled, it means 70, 30% are not. So I go into the homes of the 70% and you will find that those are the social entrepreneurs. These are the people who are achieving against the odds. They have valuable lessons to teach us about what is the solution and what is the process of, of, of transformation and redemption. And so the Woodson Center's whole premise and is we have studied the success of the real anti-poverty experts. And those are the, the, the faith leaders and healers in these communities. And we treat them as social entrepreneurs. And so we come in and provide resources, access to resources, training, so that if some of these leaders are helping 50 children, we help them to expand so they can help 500. Mm. So, so the answers to the problems of poverty and, and despair is to invest in these grassroots healing agents. I call them Josephs. And because in Josephs of Genesis, he was treated unfairly, and, but he never came to bitterness and resentment. And he was faithful to his God, even as he was going through his trials and tribulations. But if it wasn't for the good Pharaoh, a good Pharaoh is some rich and powerful person who's able to look beyond their, their, their celebrity and their influence and anticipate trouble over the horizon and then look for untutored experts as the Pharaoh in Genesis did. He reached into the prisons for a 31-year-old uneducated Hebrew a shepherd. Well, we're bringing the pharaohs of America together with the Josephs of America hmm. to form an alliance to restore this nation. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I love that. I love that illustration. I think that's going to speak to a lot of people in a way that they can understand. Can you tell us a little bit more? Tell us a little bit more about this 1776 project and why you started it. Is it a response specifically to the 1619 project? What's going on with this? Um, it was with this organization. In August, yeah. uh, August of uh, 2019, when Hannah Nicole Jones and uh, the journalist at the the New York Times published 1619, they tried to. I, I believe they were trying to weaponize our history and define America almost as a criminal organization. And they said that America uh, should be the birthday should be 1619 when the first African slaves arrived. But they really weren't slaves. They were indentured servants and all of them achieved their freedom. But nevertheless, she then went on to falsely say that the Revolutionary War was fought to protect slavery. And she had to later recant it. Right. And, and so what we wanted to do, since the messengers were black, we thought that the counter messenger should be black as well. So we brought together 23 scholars and activists, and we, we wanted to offer not a debate, but we wanted to offer a counter narrative. So we wanted an inspirational and an aspirational response so that people could get an accurate understanding of, of history. We think that that, there, that the history of slavery has not been completely told. We have to agree with them on that. But nevertheless, you don't you don't confront uh, a revised uh, I mean history by re offering it a revision. So we offered an aspirational alternative. We in our essays we talk about how there were twenty blacks who were born slaves who died millionaires. Some of them went back and purchased the plantations on which they were slaves, and and even took in the families of the destitute families of the slave masters. We talked about in our essays that when blacks were denied access to uh, a capital in the city of Chicago in 1929, they, uh, they, they started 731 businesses that had 100 million in real estate capital. But we were denied access to hotels. We started our own, the Wallahaji in Atlanta, the Carver and Calvert Hotels in Miami, the St. Teresa in New York. Of St. Charles in Chicago. We even built our own railroad hmm. uh, in, in Baltimore. So 
all of that history is 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 part of the American experience. That even Black America, only in America, can someone be born a slave and die a millionaire and come in and take in the family. That's an, an example of radical grace in action. Yes. And and but we think Americans need to. That should be a part of our history, but very few people know we were uh, only. Five percent were literate after the war, uh, after slavery, but because of the institutions within the black community, the black churches, that number went from five percent to seventy percent in less than fifty years. Nowhere on the face of the earth did the people uh, become literate at that rate. Anywhere, only in America, could that that effort of self help and self determination. Uh, only in this country uh, could that have happened. And right. so uh, we think that we should celebrate and have an accurate history. So we were offering an alternative narrative, not an alternative debate. You guys know we have a huge woke capital, woke corporation problem in the United States. It can be really hard to know where you should give your money because you are understandably worried that the company that you are buying something from is then going to turn around and use your cash to support politicians or policies or other values that are opposed to the things that you hold dear. That's why when it comes to your cell phone provider, you should at least be comforted there that you are giving your money to a company that has the same values as you. That's why I'm proud to support Patriot Mobile, which is America's only Christian conservative cell phone provider. They offer the same nationwide coverage as the major carriers. You get the same great service, plus the peace of mind that your money is supporting free speech. They have plans to fit any budget. Their customer support team is 100% U.S.-based. They provide amazing customer support. They also have special deals for veterans and first responders. You can get free activation with the offer code Ally, and you can go to patriotmobile.com slash Ally, or you can call 972-PATRIOT. So use my code Ally for that free activation. Go to patriotmobile.com slash Ally, patriotmobile.com slash Ally. And did something happen? I'm just remembering with the Trump administration, they backed the 1776 project or something, and then the Biden administration took that away, or maybe I'm thinking about some, maybe I'm thinking about critical. No, you're right. Okay. In the, wa- in the waning days of the Trump campaign, <laughs> they came up with the 1776 commission. Oh, okay. And, uh, and they brought some people. We stayed away from it. Oh, gotcha. So it was not connected because- with you guys. No, it was not connected oh. at all. And the fact that it came up almost as a part of the campaign, we became very suspicious of it. Yeah. And therefore, we uh, we stayed away from it because we don't believe the answer is in politics. Right. We, and so we, we were careful not to condemn it, but we also did not want to be associated with it because it was developed in a partisan framework when the 1776 Unites program, we have we have some liberal uh, commentators, mm-hmm. uh, essayists. Mm-hmm. Clarence Page, uh, Pulitzer Prize winning essay, uh, a reporter for the Chicago Tribune, right, um, and others, because I think that this issue is too important to get admired in politics, and that's why 1776 Unites, our book, sold out on Amazon. We've developed some curriculum from it that is now being embraced. I think we have 35,000 downloads, and all 50 states are now embracing 1776. We have an animated series coming out and that we're excited about. Um, right. We don't think that we should outlaw the teaching of 1776. I think we should put our 1776 as a competitive point of view. That you mean uh, not should, outlaw people, 1619. Right, not outlaw 1619. 
uh, but because that's canceling. If you're against cancel culture, you can't then turn around and cancel. Hmm. So we believe that our 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 essays and its content are powerful enough uh, that we can compete. Students need to know what people are 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 saying, but it ought to be competitive. Right. Well, there's certainly a debate to. Be had there is debate on the conservative side, you know, Christopher Rufo and others would take maybe, you know, a more um, policy centric approach to trying to get rid of 1619. But I totally hear your perspective as well. I think that we are all in agreement, though, that we need alternatives. It's not about whitewashing history, as a lot of people on the left say. It's talking about the good and the bad and the ugly, but realizing, as Frederick Douglass did, that the abolition of slavery and the true equality of people of all backgrounds was made possible first by this radical notion that we are all made in God's image, given inalienable rights, inherent rights by our creator that was inked into our founding documents. And without those founding documents, without the Constitution, we wouldn't have had the foundation to achieve the amazing things that we have in the way of equality. I think it was Frederick Douglass who said that the Constitution is a glorious liberty document, it's an anti-slavery document. So it sounds like that's what you guys are trying to emphasize that it's because of our foundation, not in spite of our foundation, like 1619 Project would say, that Black Americans, that all Americans have been able to achieve equal, equality in the things that they have throughout history, right? That's true. But I think that where we're, where the right makes them, uh, people on the, on, that are conservatives err, they take ideological weapons to an, a, a war of narratives. Mm. We need a ground game. We don't have one. Mm. It's not enough to complain about what the left is doing. What we're doing at the Woodson Center is actually going out into these communities and empowering grassroots leaders whose actions embody the principles. It's kind of what Jesus did when the, the disciples of John the Baptist came to him and said, are you the one that do we seek another? He didn't offer a white paper or say, this is my resume. He healed in their presence and said, Go tell them what you saw. The Woodson Center is doing just that. We're showing you gang members that were predatory last year, and now they're peaceful. These are our grassroots leaders who have transformed uh, uh, drug dealers um, into responsible citizens. So we really believe the best way to undermine what the left is doing is not by offering a counter intellectual debate with them, but why don't we uh, write about the, the, the testimonies of people whose lives have been transformed and uplifted as a consequence of the embrace of these principles? Mm. So, we, so we're seeking witnesses. Right, right. It is odd to me that there would be anyone who would be opposed to that kind of transformative and redemptive work, because that's how you make long-term changes. Left-wing policy and, and narratives really only focus on disparate numbers. And so they'll try to push bail reform or say, well, there are too many Black people in prison or there are too many Black people represented in this way. And so let's just try to finagle the outcome so it looks like all of the outcomes are equal, but they never get to the root problem. Like, what is causing the crime? Uh, the crime. What is causing the poverty? It's almost like they don't want to reckon with the fact that it really is for all of us, no matter what. Like a heart issue. It's a lifestyle issue. It's a it's a choices issue. And so I guess that would be why people on the left, with their different, I don't know, uh, or anyone, would be opposed to what you guys are doing. It's harder work. Um, it also just seems to not give them the kind of influence and the power and the money that they want. I don't know, but it's hard for me to understand why people would oppose anything that you guys are doing when it's clearly effective. Well, it's, it's not a matter of opposition. I think Bill Bennett years ago st st uh, stated the issue. He said when liberals look at poor people and efforts to self-development, they see victims. And conservatives see aliens. 
um, too many conservatives who are writing about this never talk to the people suffering the problem, nor do they reflect in their studies and in their essays the testimonies of people who have embraced these issues and therefore lives have been changed. And so we're trying to change that, that, that we need to take a narrative to a narrative fight. And so that's why I think that we're trying to get more conservatives to invest in people who are on the ground and whose actions embody the principles of our founders. That's why we're trying to recruit funding um, so that we are not guilty of what we say the left is doing. Uh, we, we put over $1,500,000 uh, into many grants going directly to these grassroots leaders who are in the, on the ground making a difference in people's lives. Mm. So it is important if we want to defend liberty that we must also help feed our ground troops. And grassroots leaders, to me, are America's new patriots, and they are the ground troops that we need to resource and, and give them an opportunity <clears throat> to speak for themselves. It's much more effective to undermine the left when you, you, you create a situation where those that they so-called marginalized groups for them to stand up after they've been in power to say, these people do not speak for us. We speak for ourselves. And we champion and embrace the values of our nation. Mm -hmm. And so that's the Woodson strategy is to provide the means for the poor to speak for themselves. And that's how you, you, you bring about major changes in our society. Last sponsor for the day, and that is Public SQ. So across the country, Americans are discovering that if we want to change the country, we have to change the way the marketplace works. We just talked about what corporations, they're a real problem. They're seeking to divide us. Big banks are freezing the accounts of people who disagree with their political views. Our supply chain is dependent on on nations that hate us, that actively work against our values, that's a problem. It's time for a change, and that change starts with you and your wallet. That's why I'm proud to partner with Public SQ, the largest directory of freedom-loving businesses our nation has ever seen. What a great service. Public SQ is the first app to connect freedom-loving Americans with their local community and the businesses that share their values. Whether you want to support a restaurant that buys from local farms or a coffee shop that took a stand against COVID mandates or a bank that would never cancel Cancel you for your political views. Public SQ is your guide. This is a wonderful tool, a wonderful service. It's a way that we can do what we talk about, which is supporting those who support our values, making red areas redder, really polarizing and balkanizing for the sake of building um, safeguards and communities that can really protect our kids and protect the values that we hold dear. So download the Public SQ app from the app Apple App Store or Google Play, create a free account and begin your search. You can also list your business for free so your local community can find you today. Download the app that's Public SQ, Public SQ. Okay. I'm wondering if you can speak just kind of as we wrap up here, specifically to my audience, which is mostly women, mostly suburban women, a lot of moms, probably ages about 25 to 40, um, and uh, particularly white Christian women are facing this onslaught of guilt that comes from Instagram influencers, really from Christian authors and influencers and even Christian pastors that especially since George Floyd have been feeding them a steady diet of conversations about white privilege, conversations about uh, white supremacy and white guilt and Robin D'Angelo and Ibram X. Kendi and Nicole Hannah Jones and even some professing Christian racial activists that really set up the same kind of left-wing narrative about racial disparities and the legacy of slavery and how white people basically need to lay prostrate before, you know, 
black people in order for there to be any change. And so a lot of white women feel a lot of pressure to simply acquiesce to left-wing narratives and to give in to left-wing policy solutions. They don't want to speak up about the things that we're talking about um, because no one wants to be called a racist and no Christian wants to be called unloving or a bigot for sure. Um, So there's just a lot of guilt and a lot of shame and a lot of fear, particularly from white Christian women when it comes to this, because they don't want to buck against the left-wing narrative and be called names. But how can they get involved and actually make a difference, speak the truth in love, and do things that can actually help the communities that many on the left are saying that they want to help, but are actually failing to help? Yours is probably the most important question that you've asked today. And I'm delighted to respond. I really believe that experience will always defeat an argument. And what we're doing at the Woodson Center, we have brought together a group called Voices of Black Mothers United. The left purports to speak to them, but they realize that America is in a moral and spiritual crisis, a free fall that is consuming our children. The leading cause of death for black children is homicide. Mm. But we also have brought together leaders of Appalachian mothers who are losing their children to prescription drugs. Yes. And we brought together moms from Silicon Valley who's losing their children to hum, to hum, uh, suicide. suicide. Mm. In Silicon Valley, the leading cause of death of teenagers is suicide. It's six times the national average. Wow, that's interesting. So we at the Woodson Center have brought together a consortium of these moms into what we call the Mother's Consortium for the first time. And it was a glorious meeting where we sat down and said that race is preventing us from coming together to address the real crisis in America, and that mm-hmm. is the future of our children that have this emptiness in their lives that's causing them to devalue their life to the point where they'll take their own or take someone else's or wasted with drugs. And so Frank Luntz moderated a, uh, a meeting of 18 of these moms that we hope to get it uh, uh, broadcast. And we edited it down to 25 minutes. He wanted to bring it down to 10 because it's so rich. And so we think that we want that, that the race issue needs to be taken off the table. And the way you take it off is place the more compelling issue that you said those moms share a lot in common with other moms who lost their children. And so we really think that at the Woodson Center, <clears throat> that this is a principal way that we can take our issue to the American public and sit with those moms to let them come together. Uh, uh, we hope to have it aired soon so that moms that you talked about can understand that America does not have a race problem and that they are being uh, uh, they're, they're being disadvantaged and so but there are solutions exist and the in the Woodson Center <clears throat> excuse me is trying to come together to bring moms together to share their mutual concerns and push race off the table that's how you do it yes absolutely i think that it is that conversation these esoteric academic conversations about things like white privilege really are distracting us. They're distracting us from the real problems and enacting real solutions. And plus, if you see the world exclusively through the lens of, well, all white people are oppressors, all black people are oppressed, then again, you fail to see the real forces of oppression that are victimizing all different kinds of people, especially children. So I love that you guys are just clearing a path for that. I think that that is very necessary work. Can you tell the people listening how they can support you, where they can find you guys, and if they want to donate or get involved, how can they do that? Yes, they can uh, reach us by the Woodson Center, uh, www.woodsoncenter.org or 1776unites.com. But the Woodson Center is where you can donate. Uh, You'll be hearing more about uh, one of the major networks is working on an hour-long documentary 
on this mother's project that we hope to be able to present it to the public soon. Oh, good. Well, I really look forward to that. We'll have to talk about that when that does come out. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. I really, really appreciate it. That's fine. I'm, I'm thinking I'm, uh, that, that I'm going to try to get certified as a as a um, race a, a race exorcist. So oh I yes. Can say to all white people, yeah, uh, you, you, it's gone. You're I wave my hand. It's gone. That's that's perfect. I think that we probably need that. There's quite a few people that yeah. need that. It seems like in our country. So um, we'll we'll make sure to add that to your title. That's right. Certified racial exorcist. I like it. I like it. Thank you so much, Mr. Woodson. Thank you. 